everybody. My name is Miss Katie, and it is time for Digital Children's Church. I am so excited this morning that it is time for Calvary Kids Connect, because every week I look forward to worshiping with you all, to teaching you all, and to learning right alongside you all. But before we can get into all that fun, I just want to make sure that we are all practicing careful online safety. That means if your parent or adult doesn't know what you're participating in, you're going to want to take a moment, let them know that you are on the internet, let them know that you're participating in Digital Children's Church, and then if during the course of Digital Children's Church anybody tries to find out information about you or ask you questions or be your friend, that's something you're going to want to let your parent or adult know as well because the internet is a great place to learn and connect, but it requires us to be a little bit more cautious when we're here. So right now, we are going to share our gratitude. That means we are going to share what we are thankful to God for. So while all of you are thinking about what you're grateful for this week, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to share with you guys. And I'm going to share first because it gives you time to think and also because you guys know the very first thing I'm thankful for, and that is all of you. I am so grateful and thankful that you have decided to participate in Children's Church this morning. I'm thankful for your encouragement and your enthusiasm and your excitement and your willingness to develop a closer relationship with God. I'm also thankful for the digital connection that allows us to be together this morning. So I'm thankful for the streaming services. I'm thankful for the cameras and the sound systems that allow us to connect in a way that we otherwise would not be able to. Because even though we can't yet be in the same place together, we can still connect and still grow in God's word together. And finally, this week, I am thankful that God always has a plan for us, even when it seems that there is danger in store for us, right? I'm grateful that God is a protector, and he is a keeper, and he keeps us safe from danger. He keeps us safe from harm. He moves us out of the way of things that would hurt us, and so I'm grateful to God for that. But what about you guys? What are you grateful for this week? Fantastic. Well, whatever you're grateful for this week, I hope it's something that continues to bring you happiness and joy every day. Right now, we're going to move on to our prayer time. In Children's Church, we do something called corporate prayer, and that is where we all pray together. Now, Corporate prayer works best when it is additional to individual prayer. So I hope that throughout the week you all are having your individual prayer times, that you're taking time out to talk to God and to listen to what God might have to say to you. But right now we are going to participate in corporate prayer. That means that we are all going to get on one accord or be in agreement, and we are going to pray together for things that affect all of us. When we're in corporate prayer, especially when we're in a formal setting like church or children's church, then we assume a prayer posture just to add to that sense of togetherness. So our prayer posture is first a bowed head to show respect to God, folded hands so you feel nice and calm, and closed eyes so that you're not distracted when you're talking to God. So if you guys will go ahead and join me in our prayer position, then I will lead us in corporate prayer right now. Dear Lord, thank you for this day, Lord God. Thank you for another opportunity to come together over the internet to worship you, Lord God, and to learn more about you. Lord God, we are so grateful and thankful that we live in a place where we can worship you in freedom, Lord God. Lord God, we pray for every child represented on this stream, Lord God. We pray for every household represented, that you would provide each and every household with joy, with peace, with good health, and with comfort, Lord God. Lord God, we thank you for this community that you've placed our church in. We thank you for the opportunity to work in ministry and to share your love with the people who surround us, Lord God. 
We pray, Lord God, that we would live lives that, we would, that would be an example to people, Lord God, that we would not only tell people about your goodness and your grace, but that we would show people through our actions what a good and loving God you are. Lord God, we thank you for just bringing us to another Sunday, Lord God. We ask that you would forgive us our sins, Lord God, that you would strengthen us where we're weak, and that you would help us to grow and to develop into the young men and women that you need us to be for the upkeep of your kingdom. We pray for Calvary. We pray for its leadership, its members, its visitors, and its friends, Lord God. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you all so much for praying with me this morning. Now, I want to take a moment, as usual, and remind you guys about your big feelings and your big voices. Some of you may know that this week has been an important week um, in the news, right? For those of you who know about George Floyd, you know that the trial was this week, and lots of people had big feelings about that, right? Some people felt nervous or overwhelmed. And when things turned out the way that they did, right, then people felt joy, but also a little bit of, of let down, right? And so we want to make sure that we are taking time to reflect on our big feelings, especially when there's something as big as this going on. You want to make very special sure that you position yourself to be able to manage your feelings. And sometimes that requires support. So when you are having big feelings, the very first thing that you are going to do is you are going to look for your helper, helper rather. You're going to look for that caring, trustworthy, safe adult that you can share with. And you are going to talk to them about your feelings. And your feelings might be confusing. They might be complicated. You may feel one way one minute and another way the next minute. And that is okay because your helper is going to help guide you through those feelings. They're going to help you get through this experience. Now, once you've looked for your helper and once you've shared with your helper, you are going to pray because as much as your helpers love you, God loves you most of all. And so you're going to take to him every thought, every concern that you have, and you are going to pray. You can pray corporately with your helper. You can pray individually by yourself, just you and God, or you can pray in both ways. All that matters is that you pray with an open heart, right, and a willingness to submit everything to God because he cares for you. And after you've done that, after you've looked, shared, prayed, then you're going to go and you're going to play because you have every confidence that God will do what he says he will do, right? That he will comfort us and he will keep us and he will take on our burdens. When we turn something over to God, we don't have to hang on to it. We don't have to keep an eye on it because God is all powerful. He's all knowing and he is always present. So he is willing and able to take care of anything that you give to him. So you are going to go and you are going to play because you know that God wants you to have a full, happy, and joyous life. And if you need to find a helper or an additional caring adult, then you can always call the church. If you need somebody to talk to, your church is here for you, and we would love to listen to you. So you can always reach us at 607-273-7291, because if you want to talk, then we want to listen. So now it's time for our recap, and this recap just allows us to go over what we've learned last week, and we do that for two reasons. The first reason that we do it is because we want to make sure that we are retaining or keeping all of the information that we learned last week. The second reason we do a recap is because we want to make sure that we can build on what we learned last week as we learn a new lesson this week. So... Last week in Children's Church, we began a new unit called Road Trip Through the Bible. Now, as the unit was introduced, we learned four important unit keywords. 
The first unit keyword was topography, right? And we know that topography is the shape of the Earth's surface in a particular area. So in the area of Ithaca, right, the Earth's surface is very hilly. That is the topography of Ithaca. We also learned the word region, and a region is just an area with certain features of land or climate, right? We also learned the word extant, and extant means it's something that exists now. It's not lost, and it's not extinct, right? And finally, we learned our fourth unit keyword, which is etymology, and etymology is just the history of a word and its meaning. So. In addition to learning these things, we had our first stop of our road trip, and we landed in Eden. And as we learned about Eden, we learned that it was the very first home of humans, right? And we also learned four important things by spending time in Eden. First, we learned that God can create something out of nothing. God doesn't need any materials at all to create what he wants to create, right? He creates the entire world out of nothing. Second, we learned that God's spirit dwells within us, right? We learned that God breathed the breath of life into the nose of the man, right? And that gave him life and energy and animation, right? God's spirit dwells in all of us. We also learned that God has a place for us, right? And sometimes when it looks empty or when it looks dark and we don't understand where we are, God is simply building around us, right? Because he has a place for us. And finally, we learned that God has given us all a purpose. For the first man, his purpose was to tend to the garden, right? And to care for all of the things there. And we each have a unique purpose in life too, because God has gifted us with purpose. So our memory verse from last week came from Genesis, the second chapter, the seventh verse, part B. That means we took the second part of that verse. And it says, the Lord breathed the breath of life into man's nose. Because we always want to remember, right, when we're, how we are treating ourselves and how we're treating others, we want to remember that that should be determined by our understanding that God's spirit lives in us and it lives in everyone around us. So, for this week, we are traveling some more and we're making our next stop at Mount Ararat. But before we can get there, we of course have some lesson keywords, right? And we know that our keywords, or sometimes key phrases, are just terms that we need to learn so that we can better understand our lesson. Our first keyword for this week is antediluvian antediluvian. Now that's a big word. It simply means before the flood, right? And so we know that there is a big flood in Genesis. We're going to talk about that a little later today. And so there's a time before the flood, which is antediluvian. Our second key word is postdiluvian. And if you guess that this is the opposite of antediluvian, you are so right. Postdiluvian simply means the time after the flood, right? So antediluvian is before the flood. Postdiluvian is after the flood. Our third key word is ark. And an ark is an enormous boat or a chest, kind of like a treasure chest, right? It holds something. It protects it. It is a place of protection, right? And so Noah built a giant, giant, giant ark into which he took his family and all living things. And his ark, by today's measurements, would be 2,275,630 and a half cubic feet. That is huge, right? It is gigantic. And so that's the ark that we'll be talking about. And our fourth and final lesson keyword this week is covenant. Now, we've had this word before, but I wanted to remind you, right? A covenant is a solemn or serious promise or agreement, right? And in today's lesson, we're talking particularly about a covenant or an agreement between God, his people, and all living things. And so we're going to get into that in just a little bit. But the first thing we're going to do is we are going to read our scriptures. Now, today we're going to be in the book of Genesis again. And in particular, we are going to be in Genesis chapter 8, 
verses 1 through 4, and Genesis chapter 9, verses 8 through 16. Now, that's a lot of verses and two chapters to navigate. If you have a Bible in front of you, and if you want to read along, we always encourage reading. And you, just, you should know, I'm going to be reading from the International Children's Version of the Bible. The Bible that you have in front of you might be a different version. And if it is, the words will look different, but the meaning is still the same, right? And if you don't have a Bible in front of you, if you don't feel like reading today, if you don't want to try and flip between chapters, that's okay, because I am going to be reading out loud, and once more, I'm going to be reading from the book of Genesis, chapters, chapter 8, verses 1 through 4, and chapter 9, verses 8 through 16. And I'm going to read those right now. Chapter 8, verses 1 through 4 read, But God remembered Noah and all the wild animals and tame animals with him in the boat. God made a wind blow over the earth, and the water went down. The underground spring stopped flowing, and the clouds in the sky stopped pouring down rain. The water that covered the earth began to go down. After 150 days, the water had gone down so much that the boat touched land again. It came to rest on one of the mountains of Ararat. This was on the seventh day of the seventh month. So now we're going to move to chapter 9, and chapter 9 starts um, several months later. So chapter 9, verse 8. Then God said to Noah and his sons, Now I am making my agreement with you and your people who will live after you. And I also make it with every living thing that is with you. It is with the birds, the tame animals, and the wild animals. It is with all that came out of the boat with you. I make this agreement, I make my agreement with every living thing on earth. I make this agreement with you. I will never again destroy all living things by flood waters. A flood will never again destroy the earth. And God said, I am making an agreement between me and you and every living creature that is with you. It will continue from now on. This is the sign. I am putting my rainbow in the clouds. It is the sign of the agreement between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth, a rainbow appears in the clouds. Then I will remember my agreement. It is between me and you and every living thing. Flood waters will never again destroy all life on the earth. When the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will see it then I will remember the agreement that continues forever. It is between me and every living thing on earth. Okay, so before we get into those scriptures specifically, I want to give you some background on Ararat or Mount Ararat, okay? Now first, in terms of the topography or the shape of the land around Ararat, okay? Although we have very little biblical knowledge of antediluvian or before the flood topography, Ararat is an extant location. It still exists today. And so we do have an understanding of its post-diluvian to topography. Mount Ararat is, unsurprisingly, a mountainous region in the easternmost part of Turkey. It is a dormant compound volcano with two cones. That means two places where lava would come out if it were an active volcano. But this is a dormant volcano, means it's sleeping, right? So it has two cones, Greater Ararat and Little Ararat. Now, in terms of the etymology of Ararat, our spelling of Ararat is adopted from the Greek spelling. The Greek spelling of Ararat is a transliteration. That's where you change the letters for more familiar letters. It is a transliteration of the Hebrew, Hebrew spelling for Uratu. 
while some have wondered if the name is linked to the Sanskrit word for holy ground, others, like the Armenian historians, connect the word to the internal name for people native to that area. And by internal name, I mean that's the name they call themselves, right? So Armenian historians believe that the place is named after the people. It is important to know that the name Ararat is an exonym, right? It means a name outside of the place, right? Ararat is an exonym. It's what we would call it. But the people who live there, amongst them, the traditional Armenian name of the region is Massis, or the largest, okay? So let's get some background on today's lesson specifically. While we're once again in the book of Genesis, we have moved forward in time about 1,500 years or 1,500 years. During the period of time between man's creation and Noah's appearance in the Bible, many, many, many things have happened. And they're outlined in Genesis 3, 4, and 5. So in those chapters, we learn of some of the things that have happened. Well, we learn of all the things that have happened. But some of those things include the creation of woman, the naming of Adam and Eve, original sin, being kicked out of the Garden of Eden, the birth of Cain and Abel, Cain's killing Abel, several generations of people being born, living, and dying, right? And all of this, all of these years, all of these events lead us to Noah. Now, Noah is first mentioned at the end of chapter 5 of Genesis when he is 500 years old. In chapter 6, we learn that the human race has become wicked. They're doing wicked and evil things. And God is very angry about this. So he decides that he's going to destroy the earth. But God is pleased by Noah. And so God warns Noah to build an ark, right? To build a big, big boat or chest of protection. And it needs to be big enough for his family. That includes his son and their wives, right? And two or seven of every kind of animal or living thing on earth. Now in chapter 7, Noah is told to get everyone and everything into the ark. And then the rain begins. And it rained and rained and rained and rained and rained, right? It rained for 40 days and 40 nights. But not only was it raining from the sky, but all of the underground streams and sources of water were bubbling up with water. Essentially, it's raining in both directions. So there is a lot of water. And this goes on for 40 days and for 40 nights. And then for 150 days, the water just continues to cover the earth. And so that brings us to chapter 8. So in chapter 8, we read the first four verses, right? Verse 1 says that God remembers Noah and the animals, and so he sends a wind so that the water will begin to go down. Now, we know that God didn't forget Noah and the animal, animals because he is all-knowing, right? He's always present. He knew exactly where they were, but God remembers them, right? So he decides it's time to make a change for them, and so he sends a great wind to lower the waters. In verse 2, all of the raining and all of the water flow from the ground stops, okay? In verses 3 and 4, the water levels continue to go down, and then 150 days after that, the ark comes to rest in the mountains of Ararat. So, we skip to chapter 9, right? And so, in the interim, right, in the area that we skipped, right, um, Noah and his sons get out of the ark, right? And they take the animals out of the ark. And so then we pick up at verse 8 of chapter 9. Here, God speaks to Noah and his sons. And then in verses 9 and, uh, and 10, God says he is making a covenant with Noah, Noah's sons, their descendants, and every living thing. Okay? In verse 11, God promises that another flood will never destroy the earth. 
in 12, he says that his covenant will continue always, right? And then he repeats the co covenant to make sure that it's clear. In verse 13, he tells us that the rainbow is the sign. In verse 14, God explains, as clouds cover the earth, rainbows will appear. And in verse 15, he says, the rainbows will appear, and, and then he will remember his covenant. And he repeats the covenant again. God wants to make very sure they understand this covenant, this agreement, right? And so, he repeats it in verse 15. And then in verse 16, God says once more, the rainbow will be a reminder of the covenant between God and all living things. Now, when I say all living things, right, this covenant is not just between God and humans. This is all living things. This covenant is between God. It's between God, Noah, Noah's sons, all of their descendants, including us, right, and all living things. That means God has a covenant with the birds, the cows, the lizards, the squirrels, the flies, the mosquitoes, the butterflies. Every living thing is in covenant relationship with God. So, what do we learn by stopping by Ararat? What's so special about this place? Well, the first thing we learn at Ararat is that we are never forgotten, right? Um, the scriptures say that God remembers Noah and the animals. The covenant says that God will be reminded, that he will remember. We know God to be all-knowing, right? He is omniscient. God, God never forgets us, right? When we use these terms, it's just because sometimes it may seem to us that we've been forgotten, but God always does things in his time. He always has his attention on us. And there are times when he calls to our attention, his attention on us, right? So it's really just a reminder that we are never forgotten, right? That God doesn't forget his promises. He doesn't forget his provision or his protection of us. We are never forgotten. The second thing we learn by visiting Mount Ararat is that God protects and he also clears danger out of the way. For example, if you were at home with your little brother or sister, and let's say your parent or adult has gone out to the mailbox, and during the time they're out at the mailbox, you see a spark start from one of the electrical plugs, right? Well, you're gonna protect your younger brothers and sisters by getting out of the house and moving to the area that your parent or adult has agreed upon with you to meet in emergencies, right? You are going to protect them from the danger. But when God protects us from danger, he not only shields us from the danger, but then he clears the danger out of the way, right? When God puts Noah and his family and animals in the ark, he protects them from the rain. He protects them from all of the water. And he does this for about a year, right? But even when it stops raining, it is dangerous for Noah and his sons and the animals to get out of the ark. There is no dry land for them. And so what God does first, now that he's protected them, is he clears away the danger, right? God dries up the land and he makes the space inhabitable for them, right? It means he makes it into a place that they can live in. So not only does God protect us, but he also clears away the danger to us. The third thing we learn is that God makes all things new. The reason that I wanted to visit Mount Ararat after visiting Eden is because Eden is our antediluvian or pre-flood starting place, right? This is where humanity begins, right? That's our starting point. Now, after the flood, post-diluvian, Mount Ararat is our new starting place, right? That is where humans emerge from the ark into this new world that has been cleaned and is ready for their use, right? Everything that's evil and wicked has been washed away, right? God will make all things new, right? And that's not only true of environment, but we know that's true for ourselves, right? We know that the same way in which the earth is cleansed from every wicked thing and every wicked person, 
through the flood, we are also cleansed, right, through baptism and through the sacrifice of Jesus, right? And so just like we're new creatures in God, God creates the whole world anew and gives us a fresh start at Mount Ararat. And finally, by visiting Mount Ararat, we learn that we are in covenant relationship with God. Now, God makes agreements and covenants with his people throughout the Bible, okay? And there are even some agreements and covenants that come before this one. But the covenant of the rainbow, right, Noah's covenant, is the first promise that is named a covenant. It's the first time that specific word is used, right? And so it's just a reminder to us that we are perpetually or always in covenant with God. It also reminds us that covenant relationship with God is for everyone, right? And for everything. There are some covenants that apply only to humans, but this is a creation covenant, right? It is a covenant between God and mankind and all living things, right? So we are all in covenant relationship with God. That means all of us are in an agreement with God. God has made a promise to us that we can rely on for eternity. So, now that we've been to Mount Ararat, of course, I want to give you a memory verse. And this memory verse comes from Genesis, the ninth chapter, the 13th verse. And it says, I am putting my rainbow in the clouds. It is the sign of agreement between me and the earth. Because I want us all to remember that we are in relationship with God. And not just any relationship. It's a covenant relationship, right? We are in a relationship of promise with God. And that is pretty awesome. Before I leave you, I also want to give you some work. I want to give you some think work and some fun work. For your think work, I want you to sit down with your parent or your adult. And I want you guys to think about this question. Why does God make a covenant or an agreement with all living things? What is it about this post-diluvian time, this time after the flood, that um, makes God make a covenant with all living things, not just humans? What do you think is so special about this covenant that it includes all living things? And then for your fun work, it is going to rain um, a bit on Sunday, and you may not be able to do it Sunday. You may not be able to complete this fun work for quite a while, but it's something that you can strive for every time it rains, right? Every time it rains, I want you to take a look in the sky and see if you can find a rainbow. Sometimes the rainbows are very faint. Sometimes they're very bright, but I want you to look for that covenant reminder in the sky that reminds us that God will never again destroy the whole world through a flood. Before I go, I also want to remind you that if you confess your sins, if you believe that Jesus is Lord and that he was born, lived, died, rose, he's coming again, if you believe that, and if you accept Jesus as your Savior, then you can be baptized, right? Once you've taken care of those three things, right, confessing, believing, and accepting, you want to have a talk with your parent or adult, and then you want to reach out to us here at the church, and we can help you through the process of baptism. And finally, I just want you to remember, as always, that Calvary loves you, that I love you, but most importantly, God loves you. Bye-bye.